One more disclaimer. The opinions expressed by Adam Sternbach in this episode are solely his own opinions and not that of Tessera and are not considered legal advice. How do you view tribalism in this space? Do you view it uh, in a good lens or what parts of it are good? What parts of it are bad? Um, I know there's a lot of fun. NFT community versus NFT community and kind of like ETH versus BTC or just like the general tribalism of anyone who kind of believes in in crypto and blockchain technology? You know, that's a good point. Um, maybe a little bit of everything. So it's Web Web 3, non-Web 3, right? Crypto right. versus NFTs is also right. one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, blockchain versus blockchain when they've got these armies getting after you on crypto Twitter. Yeah. Um, just generally, wherever you want to touch on that, I think it'd be it, interesting. It's funny because yesterday... You know, every so often, like for things that I own, I'll do kind of a Twitter search to see, you know, what's the going sentiment and like opinions of people that I would never in a million years give credence to. Like they tweet something positive about something that I own. And I'm like, this is the smartest fucking person in the world. Like, how do I get more of this? So it's just like, you know, confirmation bias, like motivated reasoning, like all these psychological things just play so into a lot of human dynamics and the reality of human relationships. Um, And so I think it's inherent in anything that people are passionate about. I mean, sports, politics, where people live, the best city. I mean, it's just like dumb shit that people like to kind of fight and argue and like align themselves with, but it is tribal. And like we, you know, come from kind of a ancestry of tribalism. So I think, it's kind of to be expected to a degree. It's often entertaining if you're kind of deep in the space. But I think from an outsider perspective, the idea that, you know, crypto and blockchain will solve all the world's ills, which I very well may be guilty of too sometimes, or perhaps more than just sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, I can certainly understand. And I think you need to like put yourself in the shoes of people outside this space to understand why they do think that like, Crypto is a Ponzi scheme and entirely built on a house of cards that has obviously, in their view, collapsed. And then the other side of that is, no, like the house of cards of a centralized exchange that was built on a house of cards collapsed. But like, that wasn't crypto. That was whatever you want to call the allegations at FTX of kind of fraud and mismanagement and internal controls and and all of that. Um, And then, you know, a variety of other centralized lending institutions and some of the things you saw with kind of the the earn models at various companies. And just, again, a lot of it comes down to marketing, I think, of like, you know, we can be an alternative bank where you'll get 10% instead of 3%. And usually there's a reason for that. And unfortunately, people found out what that was. But I understand why the pushback comes to that. But at the same time, when you, I think, begin to look at the ability to build out peer-to-peer technologies that anyone can contribute to, Anyone can learn, anyone can understand. And I think what's really unique is if like I had an idea for how I wanted Facebook or Twitter to improve, it is much more difficult for me to get an audience and get that taken seriously than if I had like the next idea for how Uniswap governance should go or like how someone should be given a grant to build. Like there are another part of this where I come from the public sector where a lot of it was like, how do you build systems that economically empower people? I do think crypto hasn't figured it out perfectly, but the idea of like retroactive public goods funding that Optimism and their foundation is doing, like those kinds of concepts where you can take a relatively small grant, it comes with generally the need to have technical skills or someone who will have technical skills. Like those are certainly barriers. And I think there's more we can do from an educational perspective to get people up to speed on that lens. But part of the reason I continue to love crypto and what the technology allows and kind of what the ability is, is because there really are very few bounds, I think, in the way that Web2 and other traditional web applications have built kind of these walled gardens where unless, you know, if they want to choke off your access point to an API at any given time, they can, you know, we saw that with other platforms years ago, where like overnight, your entire business died, frankly, because like you didn't have access to a Facebook API anymore, like they decided to push you out, things like that. And I I just think we need to give, and from an outsider perspective, like need to give a little bit more understanding to what building decentralized and permissionless applications on top of blockchains um, and decentralized ledger technology can allow for in terms of innovation and in terms of like people being able to kind of empower themselves 
when given the chance. And you aren't given that chance all that often. And I think blockchain still is unique in the fact and the way that it does allow That's for that. That's a lot of a lot to unpack there. That was a lot of really good points. I think, you know, starting at the beginning, there's nuances to tribalism, right? Um, everybody kind of has a thing that they want to be a part of, but the unique thing about the blockchain or the community that you are a part of is that you can have direct access, which is kind of what you were pointing to in the latter part of your comment, which you could never do before. You you can co you can call it co-creation, you can call it cooperative economies, um, whatever you want to call it, but you've got that ability to go in, make comments on the governance of these different organizations and influence in, in a sense. And uh, the other thing that you said that was really interesting is and you, you think about the education layer from a technical standpoint of how do I onboard, how do I use this ecosystem, right, of crypto, NFTs, what have you. But you don't think about that to get access to these pools of capital, which are unique to this space, you also have to have somewhat of a, of a, of a technical expertise, right, or have access to technical resources, which are in very low supply, right? Uh, I think the li latest numbers I've seen is like 30,000 blockchain developers worldwide. Um, that is that is not many. It is less than 1% of total developers worldwide. So there's got to be some investment in the space, investment in the time to enable people in these public goods scenarios to do it, um, which is, is fascinating because I, to me personally, like the impact side of things is like where I see like one of the biggest value adds in the space. Yeah, and I think going on that point, what, what also I think is fundamentally very interesting to me, when you talk oftentimes about wealth and like how you, again, I get back to this idea of like economic empowerment, how you allow people to kind of like elevate their personal financial situation generally. Like the idea of ownership and equity in some system, whether it's a home or a car or something like that, plays a pretty foundational element. And getting back to my kind of distinction between Web 2 and Web 3, like even if you had a great idea for Facebook and even if they implemented it, like you get no benefit from that. Like, yeah, you can own a few shares of stock, but like even that is pretty negligible in all likelihood. Um, but if you develop something and you can own protocol governance tokens and you can get rewarded in protocol governance tokens for like people using kind of a system or a, a smart contract or a protocol that you develop and you contribute to that begins to take off, I just think it reduces a lot of barriers to entry for people who like maybe don't have the complete opportunity and ability to start a company, but like they do have kind of this narrow niche of like understanding of some kind of system or some kind of technology where they can begin to contribute and they can really derive a lot of the financial, ben financial benefit of that. And again, like there will always be the consumer protection side. There will always be like, don't oversell what it actually is. But I do think one of the things that has always fascinated me about you know, where do I think the best opportunities for economic empowerment lie? Blockchain, I do think, plays a pretty significant role in that, as opposed to just kind of the traditional economic systems that we have created. Um, and I think DAOs play a role in that. And I think there's a lot of education that needs to happen. But blockchain, to me, at least still holds a lot of promise in that respect. Um, and I think more and more as we see retroactive public goods funding, the idea that like the value that you cr create can be kind of recycled where like we have public utilities like water and sewer systems and electricity and things like that. And the idea that you can kind of create similar types of systems with protocols in particular and kind of the rails and infrastructure that people use to transact online become really, really, really fascinating. Yeah. I just, uh, when, when you start to talk about that, I start to go back to Balaji's network state, um, where you're yeah. just, you're, you've kind of built the foundation and you can actually program a lot of those basic public goods into uh, a smart contract, right. That enables that community yeah. to go out and then do whatever it is that they have decided to contribute to that community. Um, one of the, one of the foundational, I think, beliefs and on which I've spent my time here, right, is is the ability to do that. I think we still got a long way to go. Uh, yeah, totally. But I, I think one of the other things on that is a lot of times regulators and policymakers will say, like, you know, show me the use cases, show me like why this technology matters. And I think it's a bit of a chicken and the egg problem to some degree, because it's very hard to get use cases without regulatory clarity. And if every token 
that you put effort into to kind of derive some type of benefit that could be shared with like a distributed community of people who are contributors begins to look like a security and potentially puts you in regulatory jeopardy, it's very difficult to get the kind of use cases that I just described where people do want to contribute and build and iterate and derive some value from, you know, having a small protocol fee that's layered on to your transacting, whether it's something like that. So I think oftentimes it's an unfair, perhaps, question about, you know, show us the use cases, because I think it's it's not possible in the U.S. to do much of this right now without a level of regulatory clarity or at least an understanding that, like, you won't get taken to task or, like, fined or come under the gun for building these types of things right now. And I think that's a pretty unfortunate reality that we find ourselves in and is also both holding back kind of what the potential of this technology is, at least in the U.S. I think we'll slowly start to see other jurisdictions take the lead there. Um, but that's, I think, got to be like a point that gets layered on to what I just said, because it's not as simple as like, oh, no one's building or no one has ideas or no one wants to do this in the way that I just described. It's not clear yeah, how to do that. they just can't. <laughs> uh, and, and sleep at night, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 